the world knows this image. A lone monarch etched into our collective memory by 66 million years of stone and story. Tyrannosaurus Rex, a name that means Tyrant Lizard King. We have always envisioned it as the ultimate solitary predator, a seven-ton phantom moving through the twilight of the Cretaceous. Its reign absolute, its throne uncontested. But what if this icon of solitude is merely a ghost of our own creation? What if the deepest secret of this ancient ruler, the very key to its dominance, was not its solitary might, but its collective fury? What if Tyrannosaurus Rex hunted in groups? You are standing on the edge of a world that is now lost to time. 66 million years ago, this was not the arid badlands of modern-day Montana or the Dakotas, but a lush, semi-tropical coastal plain we now call the Hell Creek Formation. The air you breathe is heavy, warm, and smells of damp earth and decaying vegetation. Through the giant ferns, you see them. A herd of Edmontosaurus, vast duck-billed dinosaurs, move like living mountains through the clearings. Nearby, a low-slung, armored fortress of a creature, an Ankylosaurus, grazes peacefully, its tail club resting like a forgotten weapon. And there, at the forest's edge, a family of Triceratops watches you with intelligent, ancient eyes, their iconic three horns a clear warning. This is a kingdom of titans, and every kingdom has its ruler. A tremor runs through the ground, not of thunder, but of footsteps. Each impact is a muffled drumbeat that silences the forest. It emerges from the tree line, and the scale of it is difficult for your modern mind to process. Standing nearly 13 feet, 4 meters, tall at the hips, and over 40 feet, 12 meters, long, Tyrannosaurus rex was not merely an animal, it was a walking catastrophe. This is the image that has haunted our dreams for over a century, the ultimate solitary predator. And for good reason. The evidence for this lonely reign is written into its very bones. Look at the skull. It is a masterpiece of biological engineering, over five feet long, and built not for finesse, but for overwhelming force. Its teeth, thick as railroad spikes, were not blades for slicing flesh like those of many other theropods. They were bone-crushing implements. Analysis of its skull mechanics reveals a bite force that defies imagination. Estimated at over 35,000 newtons, it was powerful enough to shear through the solid femur of a triceratops. It could turn bone into shrapnel, a hunter this capable of processing a kill, of leaving nothing behind, seems to have little need for a pack to share with. Then, you notice its eyes. Unlike many dinosaurs, they faced forward, granting it superb binocular vision. It could perceive depth with an accuracy that would rival a modern hawk, allowing it to lock onto a target and judge the killing distance with lethal precision. Its brain, particularly the olfactory lobes, was immense. This creature could smell its prey or a distant carcass from miles away, navigating its world through a tapestry of scents. This anatomical evidence, taken together, has long painted a singular portrait. A hyper-carnivore so powerful, so dominant, so perfectly equipped to hunt, kill and consume the largest and most dangerous herbivores of its time. That it had no peer and no need for allies. It was an ecological singularity, a predator that had evolved beyond the need for cooperation. This is the king the fossils built, the solitary tyrant of our textbooks and films. But bone can be deceiving. What if the stones hold another story, 
written not in the anatomy of a single animal, but in the silent spaces left between them. To challenge the legend of the solitary king, you must learn to read a different kind of story. Not one told by skeletons, but by shadows left in ancient mud. Here, in the rock of what is now British Columbia, is a 70 million year old moment, frozen in time. These are the footprints of Tyrannosaurids, the great family to which T. rex belonged. But it is not the existence of a single track that commands your attention. It is the pattern. Three distinct trackways running parallel. The stride length, the depth of the impressions, they all tell a consistent tale. These were three animals, all moving in the same direction, at the same pace. This is not a chance crossing of paths. This is a group, traveling together. While this doesn't capture them in the act of a hunt, it is a profound behavioral fossil. It suggests a social dynamic, a cohesion we never thought possible. It is the first whisper that the tyrant was not always alone. But whispers can be dismissed. For stronger proof, we must travel from the footprints of the living to the graves of the dead. In the badlands of Alberta, Canada, lies a site known as the Dry Island Bone Bed. It is a mass grave. And the victims all belong to one species, Albertosaurus sarcophagus a close, slightly older cousin of Tyrannosaurus rex. The remains of more than 20 individuals were found here, jumbled together. Crucially, they range from nimble two-year-old juveniles to massive, battle-scarred adults. The evidence suggests this was not a slow accumulation of bodies over centuries in a predator trap. This was a single, catastrophic event, perhaps a flood that wiped out an entire social group at once. This is the paleontological equivalent of a photograph of a wolf pack. The implications are staggering. If Albertosaurus and other Tyrannosaurids, like Dasplitosaurus, lived and died in groups, it forces us to ask the ultimate question. Why would the king, T-Rex, be any different? The evidence for its own group behavior is more contentious sparking some of the most heated debates in modern paleontology. Sites in Wyoming and Montana have yielded the remains of multiple Tyrannosaurus found in close proximity. Are these two evidence of a pack that perished together? Or are they merely coincidences, solitary hunters drawn to the same place over different times? The solitary model, built on its peerless anatomy, is powerful. But the trackways and the bone beds present a tantalizing, almost heretical, alternative. They suggest a creature bound by more than just hunger and instinct. They hint at a family structure, a social contract written in tooth and claw. The lone tyrant begins to feel like a myth. And in its place, a far more terrifying and complex vision emerges. The clues are on the table the anatomy of a perfect killer, and the ghost of a pack. To understand what this means, we must do more than look at the bones. We must give them life. We must witness the impossible, a tyrant hunt. But tonight, you will not witness a lone predator. You feel it first, that same deep thrumming in the ground. But this time, it is not a solo rhythm. It is a discordant symphony of immense weight. They emerge from the deepening shadows, not one, but three apparitions of terror. A colossal female, her hide a roadmap of old scars, leads the way. Flanking her are two smaller, leaner individuals, sub-adults, their movements carrying the nervous energy of youth. This is not a mob. This is a family, a pack, and they are communicating, not with roars that would alert the entire floodplain, but with infrasonic rumbles, frequencies so low they are felt more than heard, a secret language passing between them. The hunt has already begun. This is not the clumsy, roaring monster of cinema. 
This is an exhibition of lethal intelligence. The two younger tyrannosaurs separate, circling the herd from opposite sides. They are the drivers. They use the failing light as a weapon, making quick, fainting charges from the darkness, forcing the Triceratops to turn, to react, to expend energy. They are testing the defenses, probing for a weakness. The herd responds, forming a defensive wall of horns, a fortress of flesh and bone. But the relentless, coordinated pressure is unnerving them, creating confusion. Their target is chosen. An old bull on the edge of the herd, its steps slightly slower, its turn less sharp. The subadults now focus their attention, their feints becoming more daring. They dart in, forcing the bull to swing its massive head until a momentary gap opens between it and the safety of the herd. It is the only opening the matriarch needs. She has been waiting, motionless as a mountain. Now she moves. The ground explodes under her feet as she closes the distance in a few titanic strides. This is not a roar of aggression, but the sound of air being forced from the lungs of a seven-ton locomotive. The old bull turns to face her, lowering its horns. But it is too late. The matriarch does not aim for the head, for the deadly horns or the protective frill. That would be a fool's gambit. She drives her immense skull into the bull's flank, a collision that sends a shockwave through the air. And then, the bite. That bone-shattering force is not delivered in a frenzy, but with chilling precision to the hip, pulverizing the joint. The great Triceratops bellows in pain and collapses, its primary weapon, its mobility, gone. The hunt is over. As the pack descends upon its kill, you observe a clear hierarchy. The matriarch feeds first, her dominance absolute. The younger members wait, giving her space, their youthful impatience tempered by an established order. What you have just witnessed changes everything. This was not an act of brute force, but of strategy, communication, and familial cooperation. This was the work of a dynasty. But how was such a dynasty structured? And what purpose, beyond the hunt, did it serve? What you are witnessing is the answer to the great paradox. Why would a creature built for solitary dominance embrace the complexities of a group? The answer is not found in the fury of the hunt, but in the quiet moments that follow. It is about survival, risk, and above all, legacy. An adult Tyrannosaurus was a fortress of muscle and bone, but it was not invincible. The fossil record tells a story of a brutal existence. Skeletons are found with healed fractures, ribs broken by the kick of an Edmontosaurus, and horrifying facial wounds, including puncture marks from the horns of a Triceratops. A lone hunter, even a king, could suffer a debilitating injury in a single encounter, leading to starvation. In a pack, this risk is distributed. A failed hunt or an injury to one member does not spell doom for all. The family provides a safety net, dramatically increasing the odds of survival over a long and violent life. But the most compelling reason for this social bond is standing right before you, the juvenile. Tyrannosaurus rex did not spring into the world fully formed. It began its life as a hatchling not much larger than a turkey. To reach its seven-ton adult size, it underwent one of the most extreme transformations in the animal kingdom. For much of its youth, a T-Rex was not a bone-crushing behemoth, but a slender, long-legged predator built for speed. Its teeth were blade-like, suited for smaller, faster prey. Here lies the genius of the Tyrannosaur dynasty. The pack was likely a multi-generational family unit, an assembly of different age groups that allowed them to dominate the entire ecosystem. The swift juveniles could pursue prey that was too small and agile for the adults to bother with. The powerful sub-adults could act as scouts and drivers. 
and the colossal adults provided the raw power to bring down the true giants. The pack wasn't just a hunting party, it was an ecological corporation, locking down every available predator niche. More than that, it was a school. You watch the juvenile mimic the movements of its elders, learning where to bite, how to approach dangerous prey, and how to read the complex social cues of its own kind. This is how a dynasty perpetuates itself. Knowledge, not just instinct, is passed down. The bone beds, like the one at Dry Island, are the final proof. The mixture of ages found together is not random. It is the fossilized echo of a family that lived, hunted, and ultimately died together. The Solitary King is a powerful myth, but the reality is far more formidable. A creature that combined unparalleled individual power with the strategic advantages of a cooperative, intelligent, and enduring family. The pack was not just a hunting strategy. It was a cradle for the next generation of kings, a dynasty that ruled until the very day the sky fell. We step back across the threshold of 66 million years, leaving the kingdom of the tyrant lizard behind. Our journey began with a simple, powerful image, the solitary king, a monument to prehistoric power. But by following the faint whispers left in fossilized tracks and mass graves, we have resurrected a far more complex and formidable creature. Not just a monster, but a parent, a strategist, and the leader of a dynasty. The true legacy of Tyrannosaurus Rex is not just its size or power, but its enduring ability to challenge our certainty. It reminds us that the past is a story we are constantly rewriting. Each new discovery is a clue that forces us to see these lost worlds and their incredible rulers with new eyes. Of all the mysteries we've explored, which theory about the Tyrant King do you find most compelling? The solitary monarch or the leader of the pack? Share your thoughts in the comments below. To ensure you don't miss our next chronicle of the ancient world, be sure to subscribe and activate the notification bell.